Jones. You're listening to Independent Radio, 91.3 FM, WVKR Poughkeepsie, um, Independent Radio right here in Hudson Valley. It's just after 10 o'clock, and all right, let me just think to stay still. Uh, dealing with equipment I'm not terribly used to, but we'll make do because they're renovating the main studio, and it's going to be all spiffy and nice when it's all done. I'm Scott Raymond. And the music you're listening to, that last piece from uh, Greg Kirluck, also known as Alpha Wave Movement, from his album Cerulean Skies. Uh, wonderful guy, and I'm not sure what state he's living in right now, but um, always a, a wonderful guy and great musician. That song, Thermospheric Induction. Before that, Vidna Omana from a, an album called Near the Flogging Landscape, which was one of his early, early works from about 1992, when he was just just starting the ambient thing, uh, and a couple of albums from those days that never really saw the light of day much were cassettes, and um, just in the past year got reissued on Bandcamp, and so I get to hear them for the first time. That song, For Ancient Crossed, from Vidno Mana. And start off with Robert Rich, also a wonderful guy and tremendous musician, from his album Foothills, and that song called Trajectory. Now, I got a guy here in the studio. I went to see this show a few months back, uh, evening of guitar music uh, from some tremendous players, Antoine Dufour and Ian Ethan Case. And there was this other guy who I managed to sneak himself on the bill at the last minute, uh, <laughs> who proved to be a really interesting and really great musician, and not that, not that far away either from uh, somewhere in the wilds of uh, western Connecticut. So I thought, let's get him up here and uh, get him to talk and play a little something for us. So I want to introduce you uh, to the man sitting next to me, uh, Alex Anderson. How you doing, Alex? Good. How are you, Scott? Thanks for Very having good. me. Very good. Um, so now, harp guitar, that's it's not, an actual, not actually a tremendously easy instrument to learn, and it's not one of those things that when you're a kid you go, gee, I'm going to grow up and I'm going to play harp guitar. So uh, where, did you, where did you get that idea in your head that this is what I want to do? Well, uh, it kind of all started with Michael Hedges, you know, for a lot of guys. Um, but really, I started playing guitar when I was around maybe nine or ten years old. I had a uh, classical guitar that my dad bought for me. Uh, it was like a three-quarters length kind of nylon guitar because he was also a guitarist so you know that's how sort of my guitar career started um, and you know fooled around with that for a long time actually was more interested in drums and getting more into like electric you know so <laughs> it was uh, you know it, it was definitely I had fun with it um, but definitely like once I got like a drum set and I started getting into more like the rhythm stuff I really went in that direction for a very long time um, always played acoustic guitar though as I was like you know just going along that was always like my kind of other main instrument um, but then ended up playing in bands for many years, like, you know, 15 years pretty much, was in and out of different rock bands, you know, and was, was playing drums, playing bass, playing electric guitar, um, and pretty much after it's sort of the band dissipated and I got sort of tired of that scene and doing like the touring, we, we did a lot of touring actually when I was in, in some of those rock bands, um, sort of stopped playing music for a while, you know, and then, uh, this is kind of going back to my roots. It's um, you know going back to what I originally loved to do, and um, I can tell you the story because it actually is a pretty good story. I was thinking about it on the, on the way here. I first heard of Harpenzar, mm -hmm. so it was if you remember Borders, you know those those places yeah. where you can like, listen to music. So again, this is pre-internet days, so you couldn't just go online and you know YouTube your favorite artists and that's it. So uh, back when I was you know I think it's just a senior in high school, um, I had music courses all throughout. That, that year, and there, there were some times where the music teacher, if he wasn't there, I would literally have math in the first period and the rest of the day I'd be off. So I would actually go drive to Borders and spend the whole day there just listening to music. Like that was sort of like <laughs> my hard knocks of getting to know every little thing. And um, you know, I would always was always into rock and those kinds. So I would always visit all those sections first. The very last section I would ever go visit was the New Age section. And I was in a pinch looking for some sort of new inspiration. And um, when I went there, it, it, um, Michael Hedges' CD was actually one of the featured ones. And it, it was actually, sadly, for Torched, so, which was his uh, you know, tribute kind of final album. So like, as I discovered him, um, you know, and you know, I, I you know, put it on, and it was a 
amazed, you know, because it was like never heard an acoustic guitar do do what he was doing, you know. Uh, and I started, you know, once I got into one artist, or uh, one album by an artist, I would literally just buy the whole, you know, discography. <laughs> uh, so I pretty much went home that day with everything. And um, but yeah, it was at, it, it was sad because at the same point, you know, he, he I found out that he had also passed. I'm like, oh, I'm never gonna be able to see him. But there was a huge discography worth. And one of the albums had the harp guitar song because it's there on it, which I put on my debut um, as sort of a tribute because, again, it was sort of like he, he talked about in interviews of having this vision of an all harp guitar album that he never did. And so my original thing was to sort of honor that vision. I, you know, I was like, yeah, you know, there aren't really, you know, besides maybe Stephen Bennett, you know, um, there's no guy who really did just a harp guitar album, like even conceptual, you know. Um, so that was sort of, you know, when I came back to all of this, that was my, my goal and my mission. Uh, but going back to there, you know, I remember hearing that song, and of course, this is, again, pre-internet days, and I was like, there's a bass, but there's a guitar. Like, what, how could he be doing that at the same time? You know, it was just, especially being, you know, 17 years old, it was like, I, I, I was trying to figure it out, but I knew that it was too in sync with how he played that it had to be one instrument. But there was no picture, you know, on that live record. It was just him with his normal, you know, like normal, um, you know, Martin. So I'm like, what could this be? You know, so it was only years later when I started seeing maybe like, you know, some old back issues of like Guitar Player magazine where you saw him with, with the iconic, you know, picture of like the, the, the Steinberg one or the Dyer. And um, even back then, I was like, I want one of these instruments one day. I told myself that when I was like 17 <laughs> or 18 uh, because I was always introduced interested into like those kind of weird interesting instruments you know like I, I had a Kodo at one point I used to play I mean I, I just loved any kind of instruments you know um, so fast forward way back after you know all the the uh, rock band stuff ended uh, and I took a couple years off from music you know and I got married and had a child but then I really wanted to get back into it you know and Scott um, Scott Holloway, he made uh, a couple of prototypes of these dyers which are now made in California so they're handmade um, by Scott and his team, and now uh, Steve Klein's also involved, who was the original designer of, of Michael Hedges, that trans trend one that we were just talking about. So he, you know, I got to get a great price on this one, um, which you'll hear in a little bit, uh, the, the Style 8, which sort of started it all, you know, for me, and uh, I really, I went all out, I sold all my instruments, I had electric guitars, you know, all the <laughs> amps, you know, drums, I literally sold everything, so I could just focus on this. I just had this mission in my head, I just felt like I wanted to learn that song, and then hopefully create something else new with it, you know. And, and of course, I've been playing guitar up to this point, so it felt like the natural evolution of me being a drummer, being a bass player. You just combine everything into one instrument. So that's sort of how it started. Long story, sorry. Yeah, that's, a, that's perfectly okay. Now, for for people who don't understand or, or really haven't seen one, give give a little bit of an explanation as to like what exactly it is. Yeah, yeah. So basically, um, the one that I have, or the, the one that's most common, is an acoustic. Guitar, so it's basically like your standard acoustic six-string guitar with with six you know, six guitar strings, and then it also has um, either five, six, or seven sub-bass strings, which are just tuned to an open note, and you can pick, you know, a certain scale or just whatever you want to work within it. Um, and those just sort of act like bass accompaniments, or you can even play bass lines on them, which is something that Hedge is made famous for. Um, I like to sort of incorporate it as more like one instrument, where it feels like just an extension of it. I know Hedges really separated it and made it like, here's bass, here's a guitar part. Uh, and a lot of guys do that too. Uh, but my favorite part is to try and make it not sound like it's a harp guitar, but I'm still focusing on the song and the music, you know, so, but incorporating a lot of techniques. But that, that's how basically it's set up. And, and the visual, for those who, who don't know, is that you take this acoustic guitar and on the top end, going towards the, the guy's face, you basically stick about half a dozen big long fat strings which have something at the top and to hold together and as, as I recall there are no frets it's just right. a great big string that you would you would pluck the same way that you would almost you know pluck a harp string which right. is part of why it's called a harp guitar is it has that slightly harpish look and you, you pluck them the same way it's not it doesn't have frets or anything that you would uh, play this the same way that you would play a regular Guitar, you just pluck these strings and you just tune them to whatever note it is you want to tune them to and, and play them that yep. way. Exactly. Yep. So that's why when you, you hear these pieces, you'll hear a, a bass line, but it, it, there's a little bit of a limit in terms of the, the, the notes that you've actually uh, tuned those to to play them. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's true. And actually, um, 
I'm working with a new builder right now that I can give a quick plug to, but his name is uh, Michelle Pellerin, and he does amazing acoustic guitars. And we're actually working on a signature model, um, Alex Anderson, our guitar. <laughs> and uh, it's going to have an extra sub pretty much also for that reason, because, yeah, there is a limitation, which at first doesn't feel like limitation because you have these six strings and you're like trying to figure out what you want to do with them all. Uh, but then at a certain point you're like, yeah, I could hear like a lower note there or maybe a higher note there. And, um, you know, so that, it's going to have seven strings on mine, which is kind of like the modern version of harp guitars now, uh, you know, with a nice cutaway, this and that. And a lot of times too, what is common is that they have like, you know, tuners that will drop at a half step, um, which I'm, you know, toying with the idea of doing that sort of a la man ring when he, you know, in the middle of a piece, you could drop that down quick and then maybe you know, change the key of a song or something like that and really even add more interest that way. So there are ways to expand it as well. But yeah, you are limited because there's no fret in that. But imagine trying to fret up there. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's true. And, and the guitar is big and, and bulky enough as it is. Having to have this great big fretboard, it, it'd be enormous. Yeah. <laughs> and I think they do have, there's, some, like, there's so many variations of this. Like this is the common style, but um, there are some that like, have a faux fretboard behind it, you know, like you'll see some ones from the 20s or the 30s, and uh, I think some of them you might be able to play, but it seems, you know, it would be just ergonomically impossible. <laughs> it's funny because I have seen some of those pictures of like the really, really old harp guitars, and some of those are just kind of crazy looking, that yeah. they, they bear very little resemblance to what you're, you're seeing today. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they had so many different variations throughout. This is pretty much, I think, the more Americanized version of it. You know, there are European versions that have those other crazy fretboards and things. Um, there is one, you may have seen the Gibson version, the, uh, the Gibson U-Harp, uh, and it was literally like twice the size of this. And it's just this monster thing. It actually had like 11 substrings, 11 or 12. And uh, those ones are pretty much tuned um, chromatically, where, where this you want to tune it to make it to like a scale or, you know, have certain intervals. But uh, that um, I had that once, and yeah, it was just impossible to play. You know, there there was one guy who I since um, passed away, Tom um, Sheenis, I think he, he pronounced his last name, and he made that famous, and he was a wonderful player with that, and he would incorporate all those eleven bass notes, and he would actually strap it on and wear it too. It was just, just craziness, because <laughs> I remember having one, and it was just monstrous. But yeah, this I think is the best starting point for a design. It's it's sort of like the classic. That it's still playable, you know, like it's, you know, because a lot of those older ones, like that you see from the 20s and the 30s, like, you know, I pick some of them up and they're just, they're not playable instruments, you know, they're, meant, they're more antique now, this right? One. But some of those original dyers still go for a lot of money, like the ones that came out in 1909, like, and people restore them and they sound awesome, you know, and actually this one was sort of modeled after Scott had one, like an original, I forgot what, he, what years his was, but, um, you know, it was all salvaged and we played them back to back and they actually sound very similar, so, you know, so it's pretty cool, so. All right. Well, uh, Some history there. Yeah. How about uh, how about we hear something? Yeah, sure. Um, let's see. Let's see what's going on here. All right. Let me move this down a little bit. Let's see if you can hear that. So I'll do this one. Uh, this is called uh, Tree of Life, and it's the title track of my new album on Candyman.
probably turn the microphone on, wouldn't it? We're going to take a little break. Here's something off uh, the album here. Any any thoughts? Any suggestions? To... Um, maybe not the song I just played. Better <laughs> ones on the recording. <laughs> um, do um. Well, you could do the latest video that I have out right now, which is "It's Always Darkest Before the Dawn." Why don't you play that one? All righty, we can do that. You're listening to Independent Radio, ninety-one point three FM, and music from Alex Anderson here on WBKR. Um, I'm sitting here with Alex Anderson. That was from his album Tree of Life, a song called "It's Always Darkest Before the Dawn." Uh, your your first album out. Yes, my debut. Have you had other work previous as part of the whole band thing? Yeah, uh, many albums that uh, I won't mention any names because I don't <laughs> want anyone going on YouTube and looking up. Any Am I on there? Um, there we go. Am I just yep, see? you're on. Okay, all right, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I, I won't mention any names, so there's no uh, YouTube searches later. But uh, <laughs> it all for, for my acoustic work, this is pretty much the first album. Actually, I had many stops and starts along the way where... Um, I at one point had a whole kind of singer-songwriter album that I planned out and sort of like stashed that and just ended up falling back in love with like the whole fingerstyle stuff that I grew up with that was all instrumental and you know um, just really wanted again like I said making like sort of a conceptual harp guitar album that had just kind of dreamed of and sort of, sort of took it from there. And out on the Candy Rat label for those of you that don't know is a label Primarily devoted to acoustic guitar stuff, yes. a, little, a little bit of other stuff here and there, but primarily acoustic guitar and just some some wonderful people and wonderful players. And that show a couple months back, uh, just a, a tremendous show. And like I said, you kind of snuck yourself in there at the last minute, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it was something that you know it was planned before, and um, you know because obviously I, I'm a new signee to the label, and the yeah, album just got released uh, this year. And uh, we were trying to, at one point, we were talking about doing a date with me, and we could never get a venue. And then that particular day, I think Ian had to travel off to Texas or something, so it ended up not working out. But then sort of last minute, I was like, hey, I mean, I'm pretty close to Woodstock, like, maybe I could hop in, you know, I, I actually asked. And, um, <laughs> you know, no shame. And, uh, you know, Rob was like, yeah, that'd be great, you know, let me let me talk to the guys and see if they're cool with it. And of course, Antoine and all those guys, you know, they were they were, they were into it and they've, you know, liked my videos and stuff, so. So it was cool, so I feel like it's kind of part of the guys. And it was, it was a great show, you know, and um, that sort of in turn obviously met you, which is great, yeah. I could be here today. And also, you know, I saw Ian Ethan Case a few times before that show. I hadn't seen Antoine yet, but I see I saw Ian. And uh, he and I have been sort of mixing something in the pot where he's going to come in, hopefully at some point later this year, and to uh, do a little recording with me. And he did come by, check out the studio. We did a little bit of work on, on, on some mixing things. And uh, so that was really a, some, some great contacts were made, though. So you got a studio, and, and talk a little bit about that and what it is and what you do and yeah. et cetera. Sure, exactly. Um, yeah, part of, I, I always, even growing up, a, a, another backstory for you, um, I love doing all the recording stuff. Um, you know, I remember having this old Fostex tape, you know, tape recorder and uh, used to do a lot of things on that. I still have the, all those old tapes that I go back once in a while just to laugh at, but uh, <laughs> I, I had a lot of guitar stuff in there and, you know, also like Chapman Stick, I was big into that. We can chat about that, but I uh, had a lot of different ideas in there and um, I actually briefly went to college to study music production and technology. I went to University of Hartford, the, the Hart Music School. Um, you know, I ended up leaving to kind of pursue music more full time and do my own thing and touring and stuff, but uh, always interested in doing the recording aspect. Um, so it sort of just, again, came back full circle when I was starting to work on this. Um, once I, you know, got, because it's there, it was down, I pretty much spent six months just like, you know, just drilling that bass line and getting that down other ideas started to come and um, I really got back into writing music again and you know all these sort of ideas just started pouring out and of course I wanted to be able to work on it on my own time especially having a family you know and you know so I'm in a full-time job and things pretty much once my baby gets to bed I have two hours to work at the end of the night uh, you know it's so uh, it's not very conducive to going somewhere and actually renting a studio or paying that money I'm like let me invest that money into my own thing so it, it was kind of a selfish thing at first and uh, you know, did a lot of research, got all the all the top gear that I really liked, did a lot of demoing and stuff, and eventually it turned sort of into this business now that it's become this year. And um, you know, I call it Tree of Life Studio. So after the name, after the yeah. album, you know, it just sort of fit. 
and I've gotten a lot of guys uh, and gals coming in to uh, record and pretty much I've been working with two or three artists now actually coming in and I'm also doing mixing and mastering for artists too so you know if people are interested you know I primarily deal with just the finger style world but also singer songwriter acoustic music um, that's sort of what all my gear is tailored to um, but I feel pretty confident that I've been doing some some good work with it and uh, you know yeah I, I was one of my proudest accomplishments is, is that I did that whole CD myself, you know, and being my debut, and also, you know, got to release it on Candy Wrap, you know, and, and Rob and all the, you know, all the guys loved it. So that's, you know, I'm pretty proud about that. that. Yeah, it's definitely no small feat now in, in this day and age with with uh, equipment and technology and all that. Yeah, all you got to do is plug into a laptop and have a program there, and, and wow, look, I you know, I can produce my own thing. But it doesn't necessarily mean that there's uh, a whole lot of quality or thought or, or yeah. whatever. So to to make your own studio and for studios, they they there is some are somewhat open ended, but when you're gearing it more towards the acoustic thing, it, there's a very definite mindset. You got to have the right equipment. You got to build the thing the right way. You got to have the right. Uh, really acoustics in the room yep. to bring out the sound of an acoustic instrument, that, that echo, that, uh, that uh, clarity. Right. And so that, that definitely takes a lot of thought and, and effort to do that. And then to build that and produce this whole thing. Yeah, and a lot of details a went in. Go ahead. Yeah, there's, that's the thing that a lot of people just don't get. That they say, oh, okay, I can do this really easy. And it's got to be hundreds, if not thousands of hours of work that goes into getting all of that just to the point of the thing I'm holding in my hand. Yeah, it was pretty much when I started the studio, I mean, I had, you know, a very modest setup, and it turned into something that's actually pretty elaborate now, but uh, it, it really, every step along the way, things just improved so much, you know, and I felt like this was definitely a worthwhile investment. And uh, yeah, like you said, anybody can set up a mic and, and record something, but to really get, like, that next quality, there's so many details, you know, that... You know, it's really the sum of all those parts. You know, I was actually talking to my dad about it at one point, and we were saying this, like I was going through all the steps that I do just to master and mix like one song, but not even the recording part. And there's literally like hundreds of little steps that you do that equals to be that final product. So it, it, it takes a lot of time, but I love those details and like programming that and working with, you know, the recording stuff. There, there's a quote, and I, and I just remembered it now from, from one of my conversations with Will Ackerman. Because he does tremendous amounts of production work now. It's primarily what he does. Yeah, well, well. And and there's a quote he uses that's called "circumcising the ant," where <laughs> I don't, I don't really, I heard that one. <laughs> and, and and when you you think about that for a couple of seconds, you think, okay. Yeah, I, I get where he's coming from with that. <laughs> that there's this but stat. can we say that? <laughs> uh, well, we're too late for that now. Uh, but. Where you have to be that that precise yeah. yes. and, and that uh, careful and and that you know we're looking at it under a microscope going okay this like tiny little touch here or, or something that to anyone else in the world sounds beautiful and perfect you're like mm, not quite <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and I'm I'm always and I'm sure he's the same way always been a tweaker you know and I just I'm constantly searching for the better tone the better this and that so. Even as we're going along, I feel like every day you learn something new about it, and that's what I also love about it. It's like sort of part of that creative process, you know, um, which is my favorite. You know, writing, doing that, and recording is sort of similar because you're helping somebody create something that's never been there before or never done before, um, and then you also get to really fine tune those details and, and discover something new and keep learning. So yeah, no, totally, I can, I can, I get that analogy. <laughs> and 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 part of that in in the production end too is that you're you're trying to get people to go past what they, they normally do and normally know and say, okay, well, instead of being here, go this way a little, you know, take it a little bit farther, go go past your comfort zone just sure. a little bit. Sure. Yeah, and I feel like, I, and I was just recording actually yesterday, um, a great artist, uh, Dana Merritt, who's on Fret Monkey Records. And, um, there's a name. There, there's another Fred name. Yeah, they're, they're the other ones that are, you know, sort of along the lines of Candy Rat, where they deal mostly with acoustic stuff. If you haven't checked it out, there's a lot of uh, guys like uh, Travis Bowman. He's, he's another new newcomer there. But um, uh, but yeah, uh, Dana, wonderful musician. Can't wait for you to hear her stuff. But um, 
uh, she was just in and we were, you know, working on some stuff and, you know, uh, there's always a lot of, you know, banter back and forth trying to get the artist, like, you know, comfortable and, 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 and doing the right take and going through it and there's always a lot of advice, like, you know, because you're, you're so into it as you're recording, it's nice to have someone to listen to like, as you're doing it to really hear those things because you're just in it, so, yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay, let's hear something else. Sure, let me grab my guitar. I'll save the hedges for last, but uh, we'll do um, we'll do Under a Starless Sky, which was the first video uh, actually released with, with Candy Rat and sort of became my, you know, I guess a little bit of my anthem. Um, <laughs> so, and they're all in the same tuning as well, so I don't have to like sit here and tune 12 strings because <laughs> your show will be over by the time we're done. <laughs> True. <laughs> all right, same as again here. Listening to Independent Radio, 91.3 FM, WPKR Poughkeepsie. I'm Scott Raymond, and uh, this is Secret Music. And uh, let's take a quick break and hear something else. I picked one just because I thought it had a cool title and I like it. When Now Seemed Forever. Good I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Give us something a little different. Listening to WVKR Poughkeepsie, and with me here in the studio, guitarist Alex Anderson, and a piece from his new album called Tree of Life, and a song When Now Seemed Forever, which 
a little bit different from the other pieces that uh, you've been playing. Definitely more of the percussive uh, finger style technique on that one. Yes, yeah. I sort of have two sides uh, to me. Um, that was actually heavily inspired by Thomas Lee, who has now become a huge friend um, of mine. But uh, I don't know if you've heard his music much, but I've heard the name. Of, probably heard a piece or two here. Definitely, there. yeah, yeah. Definitely give him a spin. Um, amazing percussive finger style guitarist, but he does it in a way where it's not meant to be flashy because that's the that's why it gets a lot of like flack these days. This whole like percussive thing. People are like, you know, stop hitting the guitar, you know, just play it. <laughs> and, um, you know, I subscribe to if it sounds good and works for the piece, then use it, you know. And, and for me, like, especially that song, it just brought a whole other life to it. Um, but Thomas Lee's the master of that. He's, he's the groove king and um, took a lot of pointers from him to do that. Uh, and there's not a lot of guys who do the percussive on the harp guitar either, which is the other thing. Um, so I had that little scratch plate on the, on the bottom there. Oh, okay, I see and, that. And that's where you can sort of scratch your, your fingernails. And um, if you hear... Like Thomas Lee does does a cover, I think of um, "No Woman No Cry," like a Bob Marley song, and it's like all this like, and you can get this whole rhythm section going on, you know. Um, and I'm sure I know he got it from another guitarist, Eric Roach. I think I, yeah, I pronounce his name, but he's another one. Yeah, he had passed away since, and I think he was a mentor to Thomas. But um, but yeah, love Lee, and actually, I when I was writing it, I even sent him videos back and forth because we got to that point of talking, and I'm like, you know, what do you think? And he was digging it, so uh, so it was cool. So yeah, I sort of had two sides. I love that whole percussive stuff. I love all the more straightforward, you know, more like Alex Rossi kind of style. Um, but really, whatever works for the song, you know, um, is what I'll go for. So. so that's what that little piece did. Because I was looking at the guitar yeah. a little more closely going, there's a there's a lot of detail, and you've got a lot of, like, inlay stuff in the guitar, which I think is kind of neat, too. Yeah, the whole inlay, if you don't know the story, that actually is called Tree of Life. It's the this whole design, and I know I'm, I'm going away from the mic, but I'm just going to show you quick. That whole moving of that is what they dubbed as the tree of life so wow. that's how this guitar my album name and the studio name sort of got its mm -hmm. got its thing um originally i was going to get so with dyer there's different styles and that's how basically you get more ornate as you go along so the style four is like the bare bones one and then you get five six seven and eight and this is a style eight and i originally was toying with a style six or seven and that was when i was like no let me just if I'm going to do this, I'm going to go all out. <laughs> so I went all out. Okay. But it sort of became cool. It became, you know, the name of the album and, and the studio, which is kind of a, a, a nod to, to the hard guitar and anyone who knows its history. So. Was the, so the whole Tree of Life thing, that was more <coughs> based on the guitar? It was not... Well, it was more based on the guitar, and then it, it became sort of this story of my life. That, that whole album, if you look at the front cover, um, and if you had opened the booklet, each song has its own individual art to it. So if you check out the booklet, um, Sean DeVerka, who does, does the art for a lot of guys now, oh, he does all wow. the things individually. And each one really has a meaning, you know, and um, it, it is kind of a journey, sort of an autobiographical mm -hmm. graphic, and then, journey. And there really are. If you, you get this CD, there are these really cool um, artwork that uh, for, for each song, which obviously tells a little bit of a different story and that's kind of where I was leading to what in, inspires these where where these pieces yeah. come from yeah exactly yeah I mean it really was like something that took my life up until this point now you know um, which may seem you know cliche to some <laughs> artists I know a lot of people sort of do a similar thing uh, but for me and really with the birth of my daughter uh, there's one song on there um, when the world was waiting for you which is actually a gift that we that I got for my my mom that was sort of like a kid's book that you put together as they're being born and you, you marked on all their memories and stuff. And um, that song, if you see the, the, the yeah. cover art, it's like, yeah, it has like my wife with her, but or it has me waiting, yeah. So basically the whole end part where you hear a percussive, it's like a, a boom, 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 like a heartbeat kind of thing. It was really, it was to mimic the first sound that I heard of, of my wow. child. So, you know, there's a lot of moments, um, especially as, you know, she was born that, a lot of this inspiration came from, you know, I sort of started to look at my whole life up until this point, you know, when you see someone else being born and you experience that. Um, so really, that that really inspired a lot of the themes on this album. It's kind of about life and the tree of life and just giving that, so. Wow. Not to get too deep about it, but, no, this, but just... every song does have its own meaning. Uh, I like to let, let people kind of figure it out and, 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 and place their own thing. But that's one clear example on there that some people may not know about. That's kind of And here's fun. the one I, I just noticed now. There's a photograph of you 
in I just couple photographs. There's a photograph of you in the booklet holding a guitar, and it's an obvious nod to a Hedges pose. You from, got it. I forget which album it was, whether it was uh, Steel Strings yeah, or that's, whichever yeah. one. Steel Strings, uh, it was a compilation thing, yeah, and that was a, a clear nod that I want to see if anyone got. Well, now, <laughs> now you exposed it. Because <laughs> I, I had that album, it was one of those uh, windmill promo things that never saw the light of day, which yeah. it, it probably should have. But Yeah, yeah, I actually uh, have a signed copy from Hedges that, I, that who, hopefully it's real, that I got on eBay a long time ago, <laughs> but it's actually up in my studio. If anyone comes down, they can check it out, but uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that was a nod for that. You got it. No, I'm like, oh yeah, I, I, I know that pose. But <laughs> <laughs> no, and it's... It, Hedges influenced a lot of people. And there's a, it, there's a whole school of, of music that's out there these days because, because of him. And as, as Will puts it, um, when the, the great book of guitar playing is, is written, he'll have a, a significant chapter. But it's nice to see... That are pe there are people out there who, who aren't just influenced by what he did, but want to sort of carry on that, that legacy, that sound. Not sure. to try to, to be him, but say, hey, you know, he did something that I'd like to you know, continue, I'd like to honor and, and do yeah. something with. And that's exactly. a wonderful thing. Yeah. Um, now, you know, you don't do a whole lot of playing live. And, and as we talked at one point early, there, there aren't any shows coming up, but hopefully there will be soon. Yeah, there, there, there may be. I will say that uh, Ian, Ethan Case, and I have talked about one of the things that he does is um, planetarium shows, which you've ever, if you've ever seen that, he plays uh, this one planetarium that's in Glastonbury, Connecticut. Um, oh. And it's amazing. I oh. literally, probably one of the best shows that I've been to. Besides, he's just an incredible musician. It's funny that I've been out to Glast and if, uh, friend of mine out there did a concert series out there years and years and years ago but never knew there was a planetarium yeah I think it's part of like this one of the middle schools even like I it's but it's this amazing huh. place there and um, what was great is that I mean you all just sit in the chair and you watch as these choreographed visuals go along to his music which huh, especially wow. for his music that's like a soundscape that's that builds and you know some of his songs are like 20 minutes long so it's great to like have his visuals go along with it um so we talked about not that my songs are exactly like his but i think some of them like even if you open the show with like the daybreak and you go through the journey of this album it could work really well with that planetarium vibe so so we talked about you know keep your eyes peeled to the websites and all my, all my sites and there may be something coming up you know locally with him but doing a lot of studio work right now actually i'm booked out into december um with guys coming in, you know, one guy who did, um, uh, I had a campaign when we did this album, and he generously, you know, donated the top prize to record his album with me, and that was part of what helped this CD get, get <laughs> forward, uh, which is great, so he, he's excited, so he's coming down November and December, and again, I got Ian coming, so doing a lot of studio stuff, but then, you know, next year, probably more just regional stuff, um, you know, I've sort of been there, done that with like the national touring, and I'm, I'm not saying no if some well, great thing comes up. You got a wife and a kid, but, yeah, and then they kind of take some of your time there, rightfully they, so. And they definitely <laughs> do. And my favorite part of this whole process, like I alluded to, is the whole creativity part of it. And um, both doing the studio and my own stuff, I mean, I feel like when new guys come in, it's like a whole new you're helping someone create and making something new. So it's not just playing the same song over and over again for the, you know, 60th show in a row, you know, <laughs> and that's fun. And I mean, you know, some guys love to do that and the travel and that, and, and you know, and again, I'm never saying no, but it's a great opportunity, of course, you know, but, um, you know, my, my love is the creation process and helping other people create and you know, so being at home, doing the studio, working on my next album right now, actually, I'm I was, already I was going to say, there's, you're, you've already like alluded that the, the process has started. Yep. Yeah. I got almost the whole skeleton ideas worth of, of stuff for the next record. I, I definitely have an album name plan, which I'm not going to say quite yet. I'm be a little surprised. Um, but I'm hoping to release that at some point next year, you know? Um, but yeah, so in between doing all those other studios. Stuff. And Again, solo harp guitar, a little bit different, or no? I, I want to continue with that. Um, you know, I do have I, maybe for uh, an offshoot thing. I was actually thinking of doing some more kind of ambient type stuff that that we just talked about, mm -hmm. doing like a Fripertronics kind of thing. Still using the harp guitar though. I don't oh. want. I want it to be something that could be reproduced live. I don't. You know, even if it takes a looper, you know, maybe that's cool. But um, you know, I don't. You know, I again sort of been there, done that with the band thing, and like having other you know people come. Uh, you know, there may be a guest appearance here or there, but I want to focus more on be being solo, you know, acoustic guitar, solo harp guitar. Like, that's my 
you know, love and stuff. But yeah, ne next album will be a continuation of that, um, with even you know some other darker themes. Actually, it's gonna be a little, I think, on the darker end. So, but that's a little hint. We'll see. Cool. So. And tell people about you know where they can find this, uh, your website, this, you know, all, all that. All sure. That yeah, yeah. Well, if you want to see those wonderful illustrations on the inside, you would go to. Uh, CandyRat.com, I think it's CandyRatRecords.com. Uh, obviously, you can Google search me, Alex Anderson. Uh, the website is AlexAndersonHarpGuitar.com, and then all the links are there. And you can check out all the latest videos we did. We have quite a few videos up with Candy Rat. Uh, we're gonna work on one more for December, and then this album cycle is kind of done. We, you know, did all the videos for that. There's probably I think five or six videos up now for that. So. Um, they've been great, you know, helping to promote and, you know, love all the guys there. And, um, yeah, check out those sites, obviously Facebook, Instagram. If you just search Alex Anderson Harp Guitar, you'll find me. Movie. Oh, yeah, and there is, yes, I got a little bit. <laughs> there is a, a, a movie that just came out, too. Maybe you're familiar with this. It's called um, Acoustic Uprising, and it's sort of a history of fingerstyle guitar. And they have um, a lot of interviews with, you know, Andy McKee and all, all those guys, you know, um, that, are, that are in the genre. Uh, actually, my version of Because It's There that I will play for you in a moment um, was a featured performance of that. So, you know, it's sort of going on as they're, as they're talking about Michael and things like that, but you'll hear me playing in that movie. So that's pretty cool. So that, that was part of the reason why I had that song sort of prepared. Now, now you, you talk about the videos and all, and this is, and yeah, more and more people and, and a lot of musicians are, are doing this more, but it's definitely very much a, a phenomenon in the acoustic guitar community, the whole YouTube thing, mm. where acoustic guitarists from nowhere put out YouTube videos and all of a sudden they got hundreds of thousands or millions of views and, and wow, now, now it's everything's exploded and then for hopefully you're, you're trying to do some of that too. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's sort of become like the new radio, I guess, right? That's what everybody goes to is like these to get the visuals in a way, not saying... You know, you know, Here we are, on video radio. kill the radio star. Sorry. But um, um, no, but it's almost like, yeah, it's just so convenient. And I think people like having that visual. Um, for me, because a lot of guys too, to, to get a lot of hits, and I'll touch on this, it's a slightly touchy subject for some, but a lot of people will do like, you know, those cover songs, you know, and like an arrangement and put out like a fancy video for it. And uh, for me, what I like to do is again, I mean, I did, I did the one because it's their song by, by Michael, but I don't really want to do other covers. I want it to be my own music so you know so it may never be a viral video because of that you know getting those millions of hits but still my under a starless sky i think is up to like four hundred thousand something like that on wow. facebook so it's still pretty it's, good and i'm proud about it because it's like and it's an original song it's not like someone else's song which of course you're going to get hit just because people want right. to hear how you did that and you know that, i have respect just, for those guys I, doing it but beyond that it's just interesting to me how that's become such a phenomenon in the first place that and and because it's acoustic guitar, it's I'm like, how'd this come to be? I'm not upset. It's a wonderful thing. I'm like, yeah. where did this come from? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> obviously, like when Andy McKee came out with the, his YouTube videos back in 2005 or six, I think that's what started the trend. You know, and you'll still see people doing videos that look like that with the same kind of background that whatever they did back then. So that's become like the classic version of that. I think it probably started with that. You know, and then it became. Because he was like, if you search acoustic guitar, he was like the top search. I remember like in 2007 or 8 um, when YouTube was just getting more, you know, viral there. It became just completely viral. And there's probably just tons of people that came out of the woodwork, you know. I, I can do that. And, I want to do that. And for a guy like you, it's not that difficult a thing. You got a guitar, you have a, you know, camera of some sort. Yeah. Or a uh, web thing on your laptop and you just sit there and play. It's it doesn't take a whole lot of uh, you know lighting this and that. All I guess to do is sit there and play. It's well, it's the same thing <laughs> as recording though. To get a basic one, yes. Right. But to really get a nice video, that's okay. when it does. It's right. just like a recording aspect <laughs> where you need to circumcise that ant. You know? <laughs> okay. Now you got one more, and and this one wants a little bit of an introduction, I think, for for a few reasons. So I'll let you talk about it. Okay, um, or you can talk about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, you know, Michael uh, Hedge is a, a, not only just a, a tremendous player, but a tremendous human being as well. Um, and I got to see him play a couple of times, but um, 
one of his one of his signature tunes, and, and one of the things he's was really best known for, and it really sets off the playing of, of the harp guitar to hear this tune. Um, and from it was live on the Double Planet, as I recall, yes. where it first came out, yep. called "Because It's There." Anderson here live in the studio and his rendition of Because It's There from, from Michael Hedges. And it's nice to see that, hear that plays piece, not just because it's one of Michael's tunes, but because for you it really is a, a nom, an homage uh, to, to the man who inspired you. Yep, exactly. And it's a hard song to play first thing in the morning. <laughs> I'll add that. That was the whole circle around that came back to it where, uh, you know, made my final decision to make the push to even just buy the thing, you know? And then, um, of course, yeah, like that first six months when I first got this, I really just, I drilled that bass line over and over again because, you know, the way it's tuned and everything, if um, you, you sort of have to, it's not, he tuned one of the strings lower, like, in between, so it's like you have, like, your normal, like, you know, step up, step up, and then it's, like, all sort of backwards. So, like, and again, <laughs> it's just... Just true to his form, right? He probably was just like, you know, I wanted to sound like this, and I'm going to do this, and it didn't matter, you know, and it felt right to him. So, but it's sort of backwards the way you play it. So, um, ironically, I wrote the other two songs you heard in this tuning with just a couple, you know, minor tweaks to some of the bass notes. But I kept his dropped interval, you know, that that was kind of odd. Um, but it always throws you off because, you know, I'm also working on a lot of new material. And um, a lot of that is in different tunings too, so like you can get really me you know messed up which which <laughs> note is what there, but uh, but yeah, so he's you know definitely you know. An and and it's one of those pieces that there's 
there's the the audio and the visual part when you when you hear the song you're like okay this this sounds like a relatively simple piece there's, it doesn't seem all that weird or, or strange or, or technically difficult but I'm sitting here all like five feet away watching this thing going okay there's a lot of different stuff that, that's going on here it's more than just a guy and a couple of strings and, and playing there's a lot of different parts and pieces and, and motions to this that you don't really understand when, when you hear the piece yeah right? well, and the biggest thing is to touch on that quick before I forget um, that Hedges is great on that I'm still trying to work on is uh, the whole concept of string muting. So all that bass, the boo doo 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 every time you hit a note, you need to mute it right afterwards. So it becomes just as important what you don't play as what you do play. And um, the, uh, the I think it's Michael Stropes, the one who did all the tabs with, with Michael, it's uh, John, sorry, John Stropes. Um, his version, actually, if you look at the, the sheet music, they tell you when to mute and like which string has to be muted each time. So it's like a next level tablature. So Michael was always thinking of that next level, and like, that's when like if you hear a lot of covers of it, like the first thing I, I listen for is are they doing that sh that string muting technique? Because without it, it's just not the same, you know. And that's almost the hardest part, you know, is getting that right. So, well, it, a lot of that too, and, and probably the hardest part, and something that that will harps on over and over and over again. And and Michael, who as great a player as he was, and, and could play 15 million notes in the song and, and get them all right, it's, it's not about how many notes you play, it's what are they saying. Will harps over and over and over again that every note you play, everything you do has to say something, has to have a, a meaning behind it. Um, you know, not just to play a million notes, but to have a million notes say something. Right, right. And um, that's that's at the heart of, of any piece like that, not just whatever technical ability goes into that, but to have there be some some depth, some soul there. Yeah, yeah, and that, that was a big focus on, on my album too, you know, uh, there there's not a lot of flash on that, you know, I got on, on, on my record, it's more about the song, you know, so I agree 100% with what he's saying, um, you know, I feel like to me, yeah, it's still, at the end of the day, it's about trying to make someone feel something or feel inspired or, you know, to be moved. And uh, it doesn't matter, you know, how fast you're playing, you know, I mean, to, to get that. And sometimes people will be moved by your playing wicked fast and this and that. Um, <laughs> but I think Mike always made a quote, too, that he's not a speed demon, you know, he's not this and that. And, you know, he's not doing the fast, you know, kind of picking style, which I'm not either. I can't do that. I mean, maybe I can, but to me, that, that, that style of music never moved me. So I never bothered trying to do that. So for me, what moved me was, you know, like, actually one of, you know, the, the whole Breakfast in the Fields album, you know, it's so, like, sparse you know and but just it's just well placed and some of the songs like you know two days old it's like just so like amazing and so very just open and you know and just the right notes at the right time you know you know rick over's dream like those kind of songs are just like it's not about playing a bunch of notes you know what i mean it's more about what makes you feel you know well the, the funny thing a lot of something a lot of people don't know about michael is that people just people just assume that michael was always a guitar player and he wasn't when he, he was going to school and when he when Will discovered him, as I recall, he was studying electronic music. He was studying something else. And the guitar was just, it was probably just trying to pay the bills or get himself through college. He would go play in bars yeah. with an acoustic guitar just to uh, make some, some money. And that was his, his side thing. But he was yeah. studying production, electronic music, and everything else. And he, the later efforts, you heard a little bit of that where he he wanted to get away from what he'd been pigeonholed into, but it's yep. not just you know that you're an acoustic guitarist and you coming to it from a, a background where it wasn't just always playing acoustic guitar. You played drums, you played bass, and you played electric, and yep. and you know how all that stuff is. And to come from that, going okay, I'm going to do this now. Yeah, there's still all that background there too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and I feel like, yeah, and you're totally right about that. And I think that's one of the reasons why I made him so great because he didn't he, he he didn't care about the restraints of guitar or what was proper to play on guitar or like here's the way you have to play or you have to play sitting down. I mean all these things he broke the rules, you know, and that's what he's like the ultimate rebel in that fingerstyle <laughs> world. Uh, but that's what made him so great because he didn't care. He just he wanted to hear what he heard in his head, and that just sort of became his his outlet for it. You know, like you said, he, he never considered himself a guitarist. It was more 
you just play music. And again, that's why those songs are still so great today, you know, and still so groundbreaking because he just he made up his own rules as he went along, you know. So I I like to nod on that, and hopefully with the harp guitar because it, it is still kind of in its infancy as far as artists making albums and music with it. So I'm trying to push it's, it along there, too on my own way. So. There are there are the players and there are the guys that play harp guitar, and there's probably a few other harp guitar albums out there, but it, it is really uh, an undiscovered field, and there aren't a whole lot of people who've really devoted themselves to that the, the way you have. Yeah, yeah, so that, I, I sort of feel like it's become a calling for me, and just something that I want to, you know, keep pushing forward with it, and, you know, spread the knowledge of harp guitar, and how great, and I just love the instrument, I mean, really, that's what it comes down to, like, on a standard guitar, you know, I when I got back to playing music after the band, I, I did have a you know six string, and I was going through some Hedges tune, and I was writing stuff on there. But for me, it always like I don't know, it just I it didn't always hold my interest at the end of the day as far as creating something on six string. This for some reason, whenever I sit down, I always feel like it's just like the the studio work. I always feel like I'm discovering something new, and there's always something that hasn't been done yet. And that's what keeps me pushing forward, you know, and like, it's like, you know, the 16 stuff is sort of, to me, been done to death. I feel like this is like the next level. It really well, just opens it up to a whole other world. I think with anybody, it's just a question of whatever it is that you've got in your hands that, that inspires you. And there are guys yeah. with six strings that do some tremendous stuff oh, sure, and, yeah. and are wonderful. And there are guys with electrics who are doing groundbreaking stuff. When I heard Antoine's newest album and he's he's got the newest album is a double cd and he's got the acoustic album and he's got the electronic album which is not just him playing the pieces electrically but he's he's gone off in some other universe with these with these other pieces yeah. so it, it's it's stuff like that which is still breaking the boundary it, boundaries but at the same point at the end of the day it's it's the instrument that you've got in your hands that it inspires you to create something and sure. for you for me this, this, exactly now and, and I do think having those six I mean you have so many more tonal things that you can do with it you know and, mm -hmm. and being able to have the, that bass range just really makes it almost like a piano like thing where you know a lot of guys will try and tune down it, their their guitars you know it's a low, low A low B and it's just a floppy mess and sometimes that sounds good you know and like you know Hedges did a lot of that low tuning stuff which I love but this makes it so it's actually like a playable version of that, and you could even go even lower. So yeah, for me it feels like it does extend it to another level naturally, and uh, that is what what really inspires me. But yes, of course, like Antoine. And although quite a few songs on that album are harp guitar as well, so I'll make a note oh. of that. <laughs> if you didn't know that, I, so I that's why that's that. also the next level. <laughs> but yes, I agree, of course. Well, thank you very much for being here. I, I really Thanks for appreciate having me. it. Um, Definitely. And again, Alex Anderson. HarpGuitar.com and your your Tree of Life Studio is assumably linked there. Yes. And go to the Candy Rat uh, record site uh, where you can find the album and, and other Candy Rat guitars uh, there as well. And, uh, and again, thank you. I'm going to close off since you, you touched on this before. We want to hear it. Um, when the world was waiting for you. Yes. For for your daughter. Yes. Was, how old now? She is two and a half. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, yeah, she's, uh, but uh, this was written when she was, hasn't been born yet. And you'll hear the little heartbeat um, at the end, which is mimicked to the sound when we first went in for the ultrasound. So, but, uh, so yeah, shout out to them. <laughs>